official party. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Susan Richardson and I am your Master of Ceremonies for today. In the case of an emergency, please take note of your closest emergency exit and follow all directions given by the venue staff. I ask you all to join in singing the first verse of the Australian National Anthem. Graduates and guests, welcome to this graduation ceremony of CQ University Australia. Please be seated. At CQ University, our graduation ceremonies are all about the celebration of achievements. We would love for you to cheer out loudly as your friend or family member crosses the stage today. You will notice that the university mace is located centre stage. The mace is a symbol of the authority of the council of the university and signifies the university's responsibility to work for the sustenance of our present world and to ensure that future generations are not disadvantaged but are enriched by our efforts. I now invite Mr. Lyndon Davis to deliver the welcome to country. I guess yo, Wanya, Wanya Ngalam, Wanya Ngalam Janangu. Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Lyndon Davis. I was, uh, I, well, I'm a descendant of the traditional custodians and I'm very, very honoured to be here to represent my family from the district. Uh, my mother's side comes from the Malula Plains area, uh, connected to that area as long as, you know, my, I can remember, well, my grandmother who I grew up with, uh, her grandmother was from the, 
the area. Malula Plains, born there in the earliest colonial records, 1853. So I've had a very strong connection uh, on that mother's line and still have a very con strong connection because I was born and raised in the area. And uh, I get this uh, you know, opportunity to, to give a welcome on behalf of my family on the, my mother's line. And so basically I said a little bit of language there and the language that I'm uh, referring to is, uh, is known as the Gubby Gubby language. And basically that means that uh, we are the people who use the word Gubby for no. So if you say it twice, that's what you refer to in context talking about the group of people. If you say it once, it just means no, as in opposite to yes. And uh, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to know that because uh, bordering us down towards Brisbane on the other side of the North Pine River, they will start to use, in the Brisbane city districts, they will use the word Yaga for no. So we call those guys down there the Yagara speaking people. Uh, and as we go out to the west of us, uh, from the coastline all the way to the west, out to the Conondale Ranges, on the other side of that mountain range was known as the, the Waka Waka speaking people. So we know that those guys over the other side of the range use the word Waka for no. And to the north of us, uh, right up towards Harvey Bay, there was a river that divided the land and also divided the language. And so on the other side of that river, you have the Goreng Goreng people, the people who use the word Goreng for no. And so uh, there's over 250 uh, different language groups, but I'm just sort of talking about our immediate area here, Sunshine Coast districts and sort of surrounding areas, uh, neighbouring tribes. But our word for welcome, the well, closest word is wanya. Wanya means who and where. And when you first meet somebody, you do really ask the question what their name is and where they live. And so um, I use that word there. Uh, today to uh, welcome all, everybody here today on behalf of my families. Uh, my family had a great connection, as I said, and still have a very strong connection uh, through me today. Uh, you know, knowing our culture was very, very important. Knowing our landscapes was, was what it was all about. Knowing where the food was available, and usually your trees and plants will indicate that. I know a few. I know a few that... Uh, you know, it's all about our culture, and I always try to uh, pass on this local knowledge to people that live in this in this area here and surrounding areas. But our seasons, as I said, is what helped us survive here for thousands of years. Lucky on the Sunshine Coast, it's very, very resourceful. We've got um, the coastline with all your seafood, and you've got your river systems, river systems from salt water into the fresh water, and along with those rivers uh, you've got lined with many different types of vegetation, from your grasses to your bushes to your large trees. And then it rises up into the open woodlands and your gum trees, and then up into the mountain ranges where there's pockets of rainforest. So we just don't have a desert or uh, snowy mountains, you know, so it's a... It's the only sort of ones that we don't have, but every, you know, subtropical area provides us with uh, a lot of resources and our family are very, very sustainable and you take what we need. Uh, for example, when the batwing coral tree will flower, we know mud crabs are ready to be harvested on the coastline around the swamp areas. If you're after oysters, oysters will usually be indicated by the wild hops bush clustered green flower. will tell you that the green mussel will be ready to to pull off the rocks there and you know they'll be full because of the tree basically has, uh, has indicated to you that it's their season. Mullet fish is very important too. They migrate here, uh, come from the southern areas and come and uh, spawn in our water because uh, it's nice and warm. Down there it's too cold in those southern parts so they migrate all the way up here. We know when they're making their movement is when the red stringy bark starts to shed its bark. So there's all these little indicators in our bush that uh, definitely helped us survive and those indicators, those plants and animals are still here today. So I see them still today uh, and I see the evidence of uh, the hunter-gatherer mind and uh, lifestyle and culture. So you know... Um, Thank you very much for the opportunity. Congratulations to all the graduates here. Everyone's going through there, educate themselves. You know, I'm the same, I'm the thirsty for knowledge as well. I'm always uh, you know, learning off anybody and everybody these days. Just for example, um, we had to make a, a, a net uh, as part of a project. Well, we took it upon ourselves to make a fishing net. And so uh, we ask a lot of the uncles and we go, mm, 
you know how to make that fishing net? And they go, we don't know how to make it, but we know what you make it from. You make it from the cotton tree in a bark, and if you want to make it stronger, uh, you can use the sap of the red mangrove. It'll turn it red, but it'll make it really strong. But I said, do you know how to weave it together? And they said, no, that's the part we uh, weren't taught. And so I go, okay, fair enough. What's this technology we got today? That's right, we got a computer. Uh, I can get on Google and uh, YouTube and look up uh, Jamaican fishermen making nets. And on he comes on the screen making the net from start to finish and I'm going, oh, okay. Well, here's a little, uh, this guy's got the same knowledge as my uncles would have and people from this area. Sadly, my uncles and that are not here and the ones that are don't have that information, but I can just look up on the YouTube and look at a Jamaican fisherman making one. And it's the same technique as we make them over here. So I thought, he's not my elder, but he's as like my elder, so I regard him like that, you know. So, you know, that's interesting with that technology, eh? You can uh, definitely take advantage of little things like that <laughs> that you mightn't know too much about today. Uh, somebody else in the world may know it just like that one. But, um, you know, uh, custodianship was what it was all about, taking only what you needed, sustainability. And, uh, you know, we can learn off those people and we can become those next people that be the custodians to care for this place, just as the Australian Aboriginal people had done for countless generations. And so, you know, I'll leave you with that message there that we are the next custodians and that, um, you know, I'd like to use this music. Oh, it's beautiful, that maze too. Look at that artwork. Amazing. Couldn't stop staring at it, eh? Oh, wow. I'll look, check that out. Um, but yeah, very nice. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for inviting me here, acknowledging uh, our ancestors from this landscape, custodians. And uh, I'd like to use this musical instrument now as a welcoming gesture. It's not painted up as nice as that, though. <laughs> not even painted at all, no. I'm not that good. Um, but anyway, I'm not too bad at playing a didgeridoo. And so I'll use this as uh, part of the welcome to country. Um, and uh, sorry, I sort of yeah, can't hang around. I've got to go up to Pomona doing some stuff out in the bush. Uh, 90 people are waiting for me up there to take them through a walk through the bush. So what I'm talking about now, I'm going to be doing in the next hour. So <laughs> it's not a bad job I've got, but I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to give everyone a welcome on behalf of my family. One year. Thank you, Lyndon. I now invite the Chancellor, Mr. Rennie Fritchie, to deliver the address of welcome. I formally acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we stand on today, the Gabi Yabi people, and their elders, past and present. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to. Firstly, our graduating students today. We're all here today to help celebrate with you as you come across the stage and receive your degrees. And a very warm congratulations from the Council of the University and all of the university community on your achievement. I'd also like to welcome the parents and relatives and friends and supporters of the graduates 
because without all of you, probably not terribly many of them would be here today. It needs a lot of support to be a student and to go through a long course as they have done. A number of the graduating students here today have held full-time jobs and a number of the rest of them, if not holding full-time jobs, would have had to go through multiple jobs in order to uh, finance their studies. Working full-time and studying and getting a degree is a very difficult task. I've done that at one stage myself. I know exactly what it's like. It's a matter of balancing family, uh, friends, relationships, and uh, really to have the drive and the self-belief, I guess, uh, to, and the perseverance to get you through to where you are today. And it's certainly not easy. I know uh, of one student who's a relative of mine who she's working full time but she's also doing another qualification and she keeps getting distinctions and high distinctions and her husband has said to her, um, you know, why don't, why don't you just get a credit average and spend a bit more time with the family? And I must say, I could absolutely identify with that but some people uh, are not, they're not wired like that. If they're going to do it, they have to get into it and work really hard. I think whatever level uh, you've achieved uh, in your course, today you have gotten your degree. And some of you have had much larger obstacles to overcome than others. But you've done it and you're up here today. So congratulations and well done. Great job. There's good news and bad news for you and your families and supporters and that is that our motto of the university is Doctrina Perpetua, which means forever learning. And research shows that every new graduate today will go through about five to seven career changes. And a number of those career changes may require additional technical study, management study, commercial study or other related studies, and you might have to do a bit more work uh, later on. So just think about that for a bit. So once again, on behalf of all of us and on behalf of everybody here, I'd like to congratulate you once again and hope that you have a wonderful day. Thank you. I call on the Vice-Chancellor and President, Professor Scott Bowman, to deliver the opening address. Mr Chancellor, it's fantastic to be here on the Sunshine Coast for this graduation and this is one of the really nice graduations because it's a really small intimate graduation. I think we've got round about 50 people uh, graduating today. Uh, some of the graduations we do in the university are 250, 350 uh, people and uh, by the end of it the Chancellor's arm is nearly falling off. <laughs> but it's really nice that we've got a much smaller graduation today and we can afterwards uh, get to talk to uh, many of you. I was just uh, sitting and thinking uh, what can I uh, say today and I decided I'm going to... This is, you, you know when lecturers come on, it's always nice when they give a list of things they're going to talk about because then you can tick them off and you know when you're going to get off to coffee. Well, I'm going to tell you one thing and give you three pieces of advice. One, what am I going to uh, tell you? I'm going to tell you that uh, on Monday morning uh, when you got up, uh, you were part of a university uh, that was uh, a good university, a fairly big regional university with about 20,000 students in it. Today, we're actually the largest university outside a metropolitan centre, and we have something like 38,000 38, students. You're part of a university with 22 campuses, which range from Cairns in the north down to Melbourne and Adelaide and over to Geraldton uh, in the west. 
Now, it's not that we've got a fantastic uh, marketing team that went out in a matter of a week got 18,000 students. We actually merged with the Central Queensland Institute of TAFE to become Queensland's first comprehensive university, a university which is going to deliver everything from certificate one courses right through to PhD and research. So you are graduating from an incredible university, an innovative research, research university. So big changes. Now, what advice, so that's one, you can tick that, so thank God he's probably a quarter of the way through. We've only got to hear that three more times and then we can get on. That's what I used to think in lectures, didn't, didn't you think like that? God, you, yeah, yeah, admit it, yeah, okay. Number one, I want to talk about that, uh, what Lyndon said and the welcome to country, uh, and I just think it's astounding that we're actually part of a country that has a culture and a history that goes back 40 or 50,000 years. And we often hear welcome to countries and acknowledgements of countries and we just skim over them. But you can probably tell from my voice, I'm a pom. And people say, oh, it must be lovely to come from a country with so much history. And I always think, well, hang on a minute. The you know, 1066, there was something that happened then, I think, a battle in Hastings or something. You can perhaps go back a couple of thousand years, maybe 3,000 years, and you've gone through the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and then the Stone Age. But once you get to about three, two, 3,000 years out, you know, I don't know what happened in, in the UK or Europe before then. In this country, we've had a continuous culture for 50,000 years. So my advice is just, just reflect on that from time to time because it's something that is really enriches Australia, and I think sometimes that we forget that, that people for 50,000 years have actually been meeting here on this very soil to do things like we're doing today, and that celebrates success. And now we're part of that incredible culture and history. And I know my colleagues behind me really appreciate that, because I've got a, a spy uh, that was in the ladies' toilets earlier on, uh, and she's broken the sacred oath of the women's toilets and told me what was being said. And there were two members of... Well, we, I assume they were members of staff discussing my tie, an Aboriginal tie, and saying uh, how good they thought it was and what a character uh, I was. Now, I'm not sure who it was, <laughs> but the spy... And I heard everything else she said about me as well. <laughs> But she did take a recording, and we are going to get our forensics department to do some analysis on that. The next thing, uh, so uh, that's the, actually, that's the second thing. We've jumped on. Be careful what you say in toilets. Be careful. Now, for men, that's not a problem. We know who's listening to us, but I've been told that in women's toilets it's not like that. So that's second piece of advice, but only for the women. Be careful. CQ University has spies everywhere. Finally, uh, I just want to say something about opportunity. This is a university of opportunity. We have more students from low socioeconomic backgrounds than any university in Australia. We have more students from backgrounds where no one in their family has ever gone to university before. We have more regional and remote students than any other university and we have twice the national average of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. We're about giving people opportunity, and I was talking to some students this morning that really didn't do very well at school. In fact, one girl said she hadn't been to school at all, so I'm not sure what she was doing, but she didn't go to school, and here she was finishing off a, a nursing degree. We give people that opportunity. Now, you have taken the some of the opportunities that have present been presented to you, and you're here today to get your degree because you are people that take opportunities. But you're going to be given lots more opportunity now that you've graduated. Lots more opportunities. And those opportunities will sometimes be paid for, and people say, can you do this work, and we give you overtime. But take opportunities that aren't paid as well. If someone says, can you do this, or can you do this work at the weekend, just do it. Don't worry about the pay, because you will get paid many times over because you'll be seen as someone that takes opportunities and someone 
who uh, really can be promoted and given advancement in the organisation. So there will be lots of those opportunities and I want to fully back up the words that the Chancellor said, that really you've got to keep learning. In the society we're in today, actually just like that society of 40,000 years ago, where the Aboriginal people just kept learning and learning and learning and learning to become elders, we're back there. We're, we're back to the future 40,000 years ago. You've got to keep learning. You've got to keep upping your qualifications. And if you want to see one example of how that uh, can really pay off and work, here it is. Stand up. Stand up. Here's an example. Or as they say on TV, here's one I prepared earlier. You sit down now. <laughs> This is uh, Jenny Roberts, uh, left school, uh, uh, did well at, no, didn't do that well at school, um, <laughs> didn't go to university, and I'm sure this is a story that many of you will follow, uh, and she got a job in the local regional council, Rockhampton Regional Council, and then she came to the university, that was about 45 years ago. <laughs> and started work as uh, an EA, an executive assistant, or as they, I guess, were called in most organisations, a secretary. So Jenny started as a secretary, and she was then inspired by one of our professors who's now based in Noosa, and he's not here to, at the moment, Professor Deckers. Professor Deckers saw the potential in Jenny and said, you are not going to be sitting in a secretary's seat for the rest of your life. You've got to study. You've got to get on and do something with your life and get qualifications. Jenny went out and did a degree in business, so got a bachelor's degree. Uh, she's, uh, in the last couple of years, completed a master's degree at the University of Melbourne, so it's not all been good news, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, she could have done much better, couldn't she, Richard, but never mind. She decided on Melbourne, a degree in Melbourne, and on Wednesday, on Wednesday, became a Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University. So congratulations, Jenny. <laughs> now let me tell you, at the time Jenny started at the University, there were probably tens of EA is starting at the university, and every one of those EAs had the same opportunities. But Jenny grasped them, she gave up her own time, she worked, she studied, sacrificed some of her family life, perhaps didn't spend as much time with her two fantastic daughters uh, as maybe other people would have. But now that's all paying off because Jenny's got this incredible job and has got on. So the opportunities are going to be there. So I'll leave you with that thought. Take every opportunity that you can and you will get on as well as Jenny Roberts. Thank you. Thank you. I now invite the Chancellor to introduce the guest speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, I have great pleasure in introducing our guest speaker, Associate Professor Richard Walker. Richard is part of the Faculty of Education and Social Work at the University of Sydney. He teaches educational psychology at undergraduate and postgraduate levels, and with his research interests centred on ways of enhancing the learning, motivation and academic achievements of students at all levels of education, he has been awarded several Excellence in Teaching awards. Richard's early research focus was into the effects of training in metacognitive skills and motivation with primary students. These investigations were followed by research at tertiary level into autonomous and controlled motivation, as well as investigations into student motivation across a number of faculties at the University of Sydney. He has an interest in sociocultural theory, and this has led him to investigate student learning in electronic learning environments designed to support collaborative and cooperative interaction amongst students, as well as the use of textbooks and other learning resources, and after school homework support and identity formation. Recently, Richard's research activities have focused on the development of socio cultural approaches to the understanding of motivation, 
identity formation and learning through homework activities. Please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Richard Walker. <laughs> Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which the ceremony today is taking place, the Gubby Gubby people. It's a pleasure and an honour to be invited to speak to you today. Normally when I lecture, um, I just talk. But this is the first time that I've been asked to give a graduation address, so I've actually written <laughs> an address. So I apologise for that, particularly after hearing the two speakers that I've just, uh, that I've just heard speak. But as an academic, I've attended many graduation ceremonies over the last 25 years, and I've always found them to be really moving and really important uh, occasions. The conferring of degrees in ceremonies like this is a very old ritual. It doesn't go back 40 or 50,000 years, but it does go back something like around about 800 years. So ceremonies like this have been occurring over the last 800 years where people have been awarded uh, degrees. So the ceremony acknowledges um, the completion of uh, degree requirements, the completion of a period of study, and it signals entry into a community of graduates. So my own gown uh, with this um, red um, border basically signifies the award of the degree of Doctor of Philosophy at the University of Sydney. It's a degree and a gown of which I'm very proud. It took a lot of time and effort on my part. I have to admit that uh, in actual fact, uh, I've always wished that I had a soft top hat like the ones that some people here have, rather than this mortarboard which always feels as though it's going to fall off. But um, preferences and vanities aside, I encourage you all to think about the tradition that's represented uh, in, the in the gowns that you see around you, but also in the gowns of the uh, new graduates. For the new graduates, the ceremony provides an opportunity to reflect on their academic achievements and the emotional and other forms of support that have been provided by family and friends. In my own case, my parents helped me to record something like about half a million pieces of data. This was the, the research that was the basis of my PhD degree. They'd been overseas for a period of time and as soon as they landed back, they had to spend three or four weeks reading out scores for me. It was a huge task, but it would have been a much bigger task if I hadn't had their assistance. And as the Chancellor has said, all of you, I'm sure, have received assistance from your friends and families. And I'm sure that's been important assistance for you. For family and friends, the ceremony provides an opportunity to celebrate the achievement of someone close to them. In my own nuclear family, I was the first person to be awarded a degree. And in my extended family, the first person to be awarded uh, a PhD. And I'm sure that uh, given the statistics that have been presented, that there are some amongst you here for whom this is uh, your first degree within your family. And that's a great achievement, something that has to be admired and respected. I've always found graduation ceremonies to be moving because they involve a, a life transition. They involve the ending of one phase of life uh, and the transition to uh, a new phase of life. They involve a sense of pride in an achievement, but they also involve uh, a sense of anticipation concerning new doors that are going to open. So I always feel that uh, in graduation ceremonies, it's great and lovely to see the sense of anticipation and the sense of happiness on the faces of new graduates. I always find that 
really important and really moving. It's a particular pleasure to be speaking at a graduation ceremony where the majority of the students are going to be nurses and teachers. While there are many important professions in our society, there can be no more important profession than, than of nursing and teaching. Good health and good education are essential aspects of civil society. And I'm sure that everyone in the room will agree with that sentiment. Nursing and teaching are professions that have much in common. Good nursing and good teaching require many of the same skills, beliefs and values. For instance, communication skills. Good nurses and teachers need to be able to communicate with their students and patients. Empathy. Good teachers and nurses need to be able to empathise with their students and patients. An ethic of care. It's really important that teachers and nurses are concerned and have a great deal of care for their students and patients. A concern for the whole person is important in both professions. For teachers, a concern for the development of the whole person. For nurses, a concern to be able to help people to return to good health so that they can make the best of their potential. <coughs> Empathy, communication, care and concern are central aspects of good relationships. Both nursing and teaching depend very much on good relationships. Not only with colleagues, but with students and patients. In my area of research, motivation, we've only recently started to realise how important good relationships are for learning and motivation. For the remaining part of my talk, I want to speak briefly about the importance of motivation in your lives as professional people, possibly parents, but also in the lives of your patients and students. Motivation researchers consider that as human beings, we have three main needs. Firstly, the need to see ourselves as competent people people who are capable of doing things and doing them well. Secondly, a need for autonomy, a need to have choices in our lives. And thirdly, the need to have a sense of relatedness or connectedness to other people. In other words, good relationships. When these needs are met, people will be motivated They'll be confident, they'll be happy, and they'll have a sense of well-being. Our students and patients also have the same needs. When their needs for competence, autonomy, and connectedness or relatedness are met, they will also be happier, confident, and have a sense of well-being. In the area of educational research, it's only been recently that we have come to see, and research is showing this quite clearly now, that good relationships are important for student learning and achievement outcomes. From preschool through to university, it's been demonstrated in a number of recent studies that when students consider their teachers to be warm, empathic and caring, they'll have better learning outcomes. In schools, students who have good relationships with their teachers will be less disruptive and participate more in class activities. So it's essential that teachers have good relationships with their students. A sense of connectedness, 
autonomy and relationship are also important in patient recovery. I say this not on the basis of research, but on observations of a friend who recently suffered a serious injury. He was walking out of the surf, put his foot into a hole in the sand, and as a consequence of a freak accident, essentially has ended up in the spinal unit at the Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney. This is also the unit that has treated several um, high profile sports people who have sustained spinal injuries in recent times, one of them from Queensland. Watching my friend in hospital, I've seen how important these needs of competence, autonomy and connectedness are to him. In relation to competence, I've watched him progress from not being able to hold anything in his hands to struggling to lift a chip to his mouth to having a greater sense of control over his hands. But we found out yesterday that he'll never regain full control over his hands. In relation to autonomy, from being confined to bed, I've seen him now move into a wheelchair and to have a much greater sense of autonomy. He's now able to move around the hospital and to venture outside of it. And in relation to connectedness, I've watched him develop strong relationships with other patients in the ward and with healthcare professionals. I don't have much doubt that these needs for competence, autonomy and connectedness being met in the hospital context have had a great impact on him recovering and maintaining uh, a positive attitude in the face of the adversity that he's, um, he's faced. So in concluding this address, I want to congratulate you all, graduates, family and friends, on the achievement being celebrated in this ceremony and I also want to encourage you to think about the needs for competence, autonomy and connectedness that I've spoken about. Not only in your own professional and personal lives, but also in the lives of your students, patients and perhaps children. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to present a musical performance by Mr. Brett O'Neill. Brett is a graduate of CQ University's Music Theatre Program. He has starred in numerous musicals, including High School Musical, The Pajama Game, and Bye Bye Birdie. He is also an avid writer, director, and performer of educational musicals, both in Australia and New Zealand. Brett won a multiple award during his time at the Central Queensland Conservatorium, including Most Promising Voice in Music Theatre. Brett was also a member of the pop opera group Formidable, which toured Australia for three years. Please welcome Brett to the stage. I'll gather up my past and 
make some sense at last. This is the moment when all I've done, all of my dreaming, scheming, and screaming become one. This is the day. The time has come to prove to them I've made it on my own. This is the moment, my final test. Destiny beckoned, I never reckoned second best. I won't look down. This is the moment, the sweetest moment of them all. This is the moment, damn all the odds. This day or never, I'll sit forever with the gods. When I look back, I will all I now call upon the Vice-Chancellor and President, Professor Scott Bowman, to present the graduates. Will all graduates please stand and smile? <laughs> no degrees for misery guts. <laughs> Chancellor, as Vice-Chancellor and President, I certify to you and to counsel that these graduates standing before you today have fulfilled the requirements prescribed by the university and I ask that you present them with their respective awards. In the name of the council and by my authority as chancellor, I'm delighted to present our newest graduates with their awards. Ladies and gentlemen, please honour them with your applause. Will all graduates please be seated? Chancellor, I call upon the head of Noosa campus, Professor Mike Horsley, to present graduates. Chancellor, I present to you graduates from the Higher Education Division. Diploma of Learning Management, Iris Ann Envelay. Associate Degree of Engineering, Civil, Daniel Paul Clark. <laughs> B 
Bachelor of Accounting, Robin Elizabeth Chatfield. <laughs> Bachelor of Laws, Chantelle Schoenwinkel. Bachelor of Learning Design, Sean Anthony Mulick. <laughs> Bachelor of Learning Management, Early Childhood Education, Carly Jasmine Laura Brown. Megan Jane Campbell Hedges. <laughs> Cara Elizabeth Morgan. <laughs> Larissa Vote. Kerry Ann Whitbread. <laughs> Bachelor of Learning Management, Early Childhood Education with Distinction, Miata Whiten. Bachelor of Learning Management, Primary Education, Keeley Catherine McClurg. Leanne Marie Rabine. Bachelor of Learning Management, Primary Education, with distinction, Julie Alice Mitchell. <laughs> Stephanie Audrey well Walls Watson. Bachelor of Learning Management, Secondary and Vocational Education and Training, Brendan John Smith. <laughs> Bachelor of Nursing, Marielle Grace Adset. Timothy James Connor. <laughs> Brooke Louise Hodgins. Penelope Jane McWilliams. <laughs> Rebecca Nairi Neal. <laughs> Jody Michelle Payton.
Dinah Jade Thomas. <laughs> Bachelor of Nursing with Distinction, Belinda Ann Clare. Vicky Louise Jones. <laughs> Katrina Alice Kennedy. Shana Leather. <laughs> Belinda Leanne McRae. <laughs> Leonie Margaret Thompson. Bachelor of Nursing with Distinction, School of Nursing and Midwifery Medalist. <laughs> Stephanie Maris Woodburn. Bachelor of Paramedic Science, Clinical, Janet May Kenner. <laughs> Bachelor of Social Work, Ellen Amy Strath Calloway. Cheryl Rowe. <laughs> Bachelor of Social Work with Distinction, Melissa Grace Mamana. School of Human Health and Social Sciences Medalist, Monique Barbara Healy. Bachelor of Psychology with Honours, Kylie Vanessa Connolly. <laughs> Bachelor of Psychology with Honours, Kaya Jane Heron. Bachelor of Psychology with Honours, Carrie Jean Manier. <laughs> Bachelor of Social Work with Honours, Terry MacDonald.
Graduate Certificate in Creative Industries, Irene Allison Waters. Graduate Diploma of Learning and Teaching, Alicia Nicole Giesman. <laughs> Graduate Diploma of Learning and Teaching, Secondary, Bradley Ernest Small. Master of Clinical Psychology, Jamie Lee Parnell. <laughs> Master of Letters with Distinction, Dallas Wright Sutherland. Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates. I now call upon the Dean of the School of Education and Arts, Professor Helen Huntley, to present the doctoral graduate. Chancellor, I have the honour to present to you the following doctoral graduate. This candidate has under undertaken a program of supervised research and study which has made a significant original contribution to knowledge. This qualification is a highly regarded achievement where the candidate has demonstrated highly specialised knowledge through thesis dissertation. Doctoral programs may be undertaken in many disciplines and only high calibre graduates who have demonstrated academic merit may obtain entry to this award. Research is an integral part of CQ University Australia's purpose. We have a strong commitment to the conduct of cutting edge research in new areas which challenge the boundaries of the traditional disciplines to provide distinctive research solutions with regional, national and international benefit. I present Eleanor Sandra Horton for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. <laughs> I have to tell you a bit about it. Eleanor's thesis title is A Foucauldian Gaze in Nursing, a critique of the politics of difference in nursing. This research aimed to present a new text in nursing that challenged the maintenance of the status in nursing and made a contribution to the post-structuralist body of literature focused on the politics of difference and related concepts such as othering, neoliberalism and globalisation. Dr Eleanor Horton. Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of doctoral graduates. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to present to you another musical performance by Mr. Brett O'Neill. Oh, 
Thank you. I now call upon Mrs. Stephanie Watson to deliver the response by the graduates' representative. Good afternoon, Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, Associate Professor Richard Walker, and guests. I'm truly honoured to be given the opportunity to address today's graduates to this ceremony, for which most of us is a culmination of many years of very hard work, and which in itself will have changed all our lives to some degree. Congratulations to us all. <laughs> for many of us, we have had the support of our loved ones to assist us with our success. I myself know I would not have been able to complete my studies if it wasn't for the support of my family. Uh, they helped me by looking after my two young daughters during my three and a half years of study and continue to do so while I'm working in my chosen profession, primary teaching. They are also there to support me when I thought I couldn't keep going with the demands of study due to my responsibilities of being a parent and wife. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Furthermore, on behalf of the graduates, I'd like to thank all those wonderful lecturers and other who have encouraged us to persevere during those down times and rejoice in the good times. The inspiration, support and enthusiasm from my lecturers and the mentor teachers was amazing throughout my studies. And I'm sure all the graduates here today experience this at their campuses or on distance education. I'm sure many of us have achieved goals far beyond our dreams and all now having received the ultimate reward. The emergence of CQ University into a wider area of South East Queensland has facilitated the opportunity of so many people like us to enter a university life. The Noosa campus allowed me to fulfil my dreams of becoming a primary school teacher. With the modern ways of thinking, I have confidently entered my working profession knowing I have the up-to-date strategies and methods for teaching in the 21st century. I'm sure all the graduates here today from the various programs of CQU feel the same way. Thank you. Um, also, um, Associate Professor Richard Walker, as a token of our appreciation, we'd like to present you with this gift today on behalf of all the graduates. Thank you, Stephanie. I ask all new graduates to please stand.
I charge you as graduates of CQ University Australia to maintain a commitment to lifelong learning, to strive for truth, integrity and compassion, to contribute to your chosen professions and by the application of your abilities to support and nurture the communities of which you are a part. May your rewards bring honour to your university, to your chosen profession and to yourselves. Good luck. I'd now like to ask all the new graduates to turn around and face your parents and supporters and give them a clap for helping you. <laughs> Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the ceremony. On behalf of the Chancellor, members of the University Council and CQ University Noosa staff, I would like to thank you for attending and invite you to join us for refreshments on the mezzanine outside. I ask you now to stand, please, while the official party retires. <laughs>